prepared. In this video, I am going to go through all of the information you need to know to start playing Stellaris. Every single piece of information I think that you probably need to get going as a beginner and have all of your questions answered will be covered in this gargantuan guide video. Of course, I'm going to chapter it so you can run around to different chapters. And I should note that I am going to be playing with all of the DLC. Unlike previous Beginner's Guide videos where I played with only the base game, given that Paradox now have offered access to all of the DLC for just, uh, I believe, 10 euros or 10 dollars for one month, you can get access to everything. So I'm going to give a guide for everything. We're going to cover in this video every single menu, every single tooltip, and every single button. We're going to cover war, we're going to cover the galactic community, federations, vassals, everything you need in the first 50 years of the game to understand. We're going to go through it all. So sit down, make sure you've got yourself a drink and a snack, and you are comfortable. And without any further ado, let's dive into Stellaris. We really are going to start with the basics and what could be more basic than knowing you need to click on new game to start a new game. From there, we get to the empire creation screen. You can either select a random empire, create your own empire, or select one of the pre-made empires in the game. For your first game, I'd probably recommend you start by playing the United Nations of Earth. They generally give you a good handle on what to do in the galaxy. And because they're xenophile, you're going to find the AI likes you more and is more pleasant towards you. We can, of course, edit and customize all of these nations and create your own. Jumping briefly into the Empire creation screen, let's look at what everything does. From top to bottom, we have the appearance. This is where you can choose the portrait of your species basically choosing what the population will look like in the game. You can set your species name. This is important for event and flavor text. You can choose a specific name list. This will choose the planet names, leader names, ship names, and fleet names. Don't worry about this one too much though, because you can absolutely edit every single named thing in the game. We can change planet names, leader names, ship names, and fleet names at will to anything we would like. Traits represent the unique characteristics of your species. You start with a number of trait points and a maximum of five trait picks. That means we can have five different traits. There are two types of traits. Traits that cost points, as we can see here, natural sociologists cost one point, and traits that reward points. Traits that give us points like non-adaptive usually have a negative modifier, and traits that cost points have a positive modifier. All of these traits will make minute adjustments to the way that your empire performs without really changing too much about the gameplay. We can set our homeworld name and class as well as our star name. And if you really want to, you can change the type of starting system you begin in, uh, whether that's going to be a random binary star system, a random unary star system, or just the basic soul system. Planet classes are divided into three types. Dry worlds, like desert worlds, arid, and savannah. Wet worlds, like ocean, continental, and tropical. And frozen worlds, like arctic, alpine, and tundra. Depending on which class we choose from, we will have a bonus to habitability, that is how easily your people can live on a planet, of worlds close to us. So if we are continental preference, like these humans, Ocean worlds and tropical worlds are relatively safe for us to live on and won't give us too many negative modifiers. You can colonize basically any world, but worlds with low habitability, like an arid world would be to us humans, well, they tend to cause you some economic hardship. We can also choose our city appearance and the way that the room looks for us in the diplomatic screen. The only place you'll see this is on the Empire tab in game. Otherwise, this is mainly for multiplayer if you want to choose how people see your empire. Origins describe the backstory of our empire. They generally also give you some bonuses or special advantages. And some, like Necrophage for example, radically alter your playstyle by adding in new features that basically change the way the gameplay loop works for you. In this instance, Necrophage gives us a secondary species and we're going to be killing some of those secondary species to create our primary species. Our population don't grow, they are made. The Government and Ethics tab really defines who your civilization are now. We can choose from a number of different ethics, and these ethics are split into different categories. We have Authoritarian and Egalitarian, two sides of the same coin, Spiritualist and Materialist, Militarist and Pacifist, and Xenophobe and Xenophile. 
Depending on which of the ethics you choose, this will change the laws available to your civilization. For example, only xenophobic or authoritarian empires can enslave aliens or entire species. Pacifist empires find it very difficult to go to war and wars of conquest are basically impossible. You can see roughly what each of these ethics will do by hovering over them. There's one other type as well that's in the center here and that is a Gestalt Consciousness. Gestalt Consciousness empires can either be machine intelligences or hive minds. They function quite differently to normal biological empires. They don't use consumer goods, they have no happiness, but generally they have different changes to growth speed. Hive minds will be growing faster, getting more population, whereas machine intelligences basically have no population growth and build lots and lots of extra robots. We also have authority types available for regular empires. There are four basic authorities, democratic, oligarchic, dictatorial, and imperial. These all again have small changes on the way that your empire functions. For example, dictatorial here reduces the number of different leaders we can choose between, but lets our ruler get higher levels faster. It also changes what bonuses our ruler grants us. Finally, there is the corporate authority. Corporate radically alters the gameplay by allowing you to set up branch offices on foreign worlds. That means you can make lots and lots of money through friends, but you do need to find friends unless you want to become a criminal megacorp. Lastly on this screen, we have civics. Once we've chosen our ethics and our authority, a number of different civics will be available to us. The civics basically have some gameplay modifiers. Occasionally, it will change your entire playstyle, but often it's just a minor thumb on the scale. For example, Beacon of Liberty increases our unity from pops, that's a type of resource, and reduces empire size from our population. All of these civics also come with different council positions that modify your empire yet further with more changes. We can select an advisor voice if you're into that. You can choose your empire name and adjective. You can choose a flag and your flag color. This is how your empire will be represented in the galactic map. You can choose from one of many different ship appearances to specifically and uniquely alter the way your empire presents itself in the galaxy. And finally, you can choose the way your ruler looks, give them a different title, a different name, and pick one trait for them, as well as choosing their leader class. As I mentioned before though, don't worry too much in your first playthrough about trying to alter these settings, just pick one of the preset empires and get going. Next we can choose the game details in our galaxy. I'd probably recommend you drop down to a small sized galaxy. That is going to be slightly easier on most computer setups and means there won't be too many AI empires out in the galaxy to deal with. Also note on the default setting, you start the game on cadet difficulty, which gives you some bonuses to your economy, research and naval capacity. If you really want to learn the game, you probably want to switch over to the ensign difficulty. That way you get no inherent economic, scientific or military bonuses, but neither does the AI. Higher difficulty levels basically scale the AI up and give them more and more bonuses. And a Grand Admiral, they basically get crazy, crazy bonuses. Once you're happy fiddling with the settings, it's time to press play. And you'll be transported directly to Stellaris. This is the start date. Stellaris always starts at the year 2200 of some calendar. We're going to assume it's the United Nations of Earth calendar, but given you can start a game without Earth existing, it could just be any old calendar. Now you may have a pop-up here for a tutorial. I have the tutorial disabled, and if you do get the tutorial, just tell it to go away. Honestly, it's it's deeply annoying most of the time. You'll get a mineral for that, so, so go for that. Right, let's break down what we're seeing on our screen here, because we're getting a lot of information pushed into our faces right at once from the UI. First, and possibly most important, is the top right corner of the screen. This shows you the current date. Now, Stellaris is not a turn-based strategy game. It is more of a real-time strategy game. We can pause and unpause the game. When we unpause the game, time will start flowing. We can choose the rate of flow of time by increasing or decreasing it, making it faster or slower as well. But time will start flowing and things will start happening. While the game is paused, we can queue up lots of orders, we can queue up buildings to build, we can move our population around, we can change our law, we can decide on our research projects. We can also do all of that while the game is running, but when it's your first few playthroughs, I definitely recommend pausing the game to get things done and then pressing play again when you're ready to let everything unfold. 
moving from the furthest right all the way to the furthest left, you'll then see all of the resources you have in your empire. This top tab basically keeps track of your economy. First off, we have energy credits. Energy credits can be used to buy other basic or advanced resources if you are producing them. They're also very important for upkeep. Lots of buildings and districts and things like ships and star bases in your empire require energy credits for upkeep. Next along, we have minerals. Minerals are used to build mining stations and research stations in space. Those collect spaceborne resources and also to build districts and buildings on our planets. We also use minerals to create the advanced resources, consumer goods and alloys, which I'll get onto in a moment. Food is generally a pretty useless resource. This is almost entirely only consumed by your population when your population are eating. For obvious reasons, most machines don't actually start the game with any food income and don't really use it if they get that. Generally, you want to just about balance your food A net excess of food isn't really super useful to you. Consumer goods are created by artisans who convert minerals into these consumer goods on your planet. They are used to upkeep the living standards of your population and certain jobs like researchers and bureaucrats require consumer goods in order to produce more advanced resources like research and unity. Alloys are one of the most important resources in the game. Alloys are used to build ships and star bases. This is the main measure of your potential military size. Metallurgists on your planet create alloys from minerals. Influence is basically a kind of mana. You can produce more of it by having more power projection, I'll get to what that is in a moment, and getting other bonuses stacked up through your game. We're going to be using the influence to expand the borders of our empire, as well as claiming other systems if we want to take them from an empire that has already got them first. Later in the game, you'll also use influence to build things like habitats, which are giant space-based structures that your population can live on, kind of like a planet, as well as hyper relays, that's kind of like space trains, gateway networks, and other things. Unity is used to recruit leaders, we also use it to purchase traditions. Traditions are a bit like technologies, except we use Unity to grab them. They basically provide some bonuses to our empire. We also need Unity to upkeep our leaders. The more leaders we have in our empire, the more Unity we have to spend on maintaining them. Research, as you probably are unsurprised to hear, is used to research technologies. This is, next to alloys, probably the most important resource in the game. After that, we have the Rare Resources tab. At the start of the game, you don't have any rare resource income, probably, unless you've chosen some really interesting civics or traits. And later on, we will research ways of creating rare resources, either synthetically or by mining them out there in the galaxy. And then we can use those rare resources to upkeep special advanced buildings and put special advanced components, weapons, and defenses on our fleets. Empire size is a measure of how large our empire is but this is actually not a very good thing. The higher your empire size, the more technologies cost, the more traditions cost, and the more edicts cost to upkeep. You actually want to minimize empire size. Empire size is a combination of the number of districts you have in your empire, the number of systems you control, the number of planets you control, and the number of population called pops that you have across all of your space. Increasing all of those numbers is good because it means we are going to be doing better economically, but it does come at a cost. The larger your empire, the slower it will research things and the more resources it needs to produce to research. This is basically a balancing mechanism to prevent empires that are overly large from running away with the game. Empire population just tells you how many pops you have across your empire. We'll get to what pops are very soon. We also have a number of envoys. Envoys right at the start are entirely useless. As we explore the galaxy, we'll start making first contact with other species. We'll need envoys to complete first contacts. Later on, we can assign them to spy on other empires, improve relations, harm relations, all of those sort of diplomatic things. Starbase capacity represents the number of upgraded starbases we can have in our empire. We start the game with a single upgraded starbase at our capital, and that one here has a shipyard, a trade hub, and a crew quarters. 
That is why we are at one of three starbase capacity. As we expand our borders, this number does increase slightly. For every 10 systems you have, you get another starbase capacity, but we also have lots of other technologies that can increase this as well later on in the game. You don't really want to go too high over your starbase capacity. This is a soft cap, but every upgraded starbase over this capacity increases your empire-wide starbase upkeep by a further 25%. Finally, on the far right here, we have naval capacity. This is the effective number of ships that our empire is able to support. Different ship classes use up different amounts of naval capacity. At the start of the game, we only have access to corvettes, the smallest and weakest ship class, and each corvette only uses one naval capacity. As our ship sizes get bigger, for example, the next class up is destroyer, they use more capacity. Destroyers use two naval capacity per ship. Going over naval capacity is again, like starbase capacity, a soft cap, but what it does when over this capacity is scale your ship upkeep by the percentage you are over naval capacity. For example, if we were at 40 naval capacity, we would be paying double ship upkeep on every ship. So going from 20 to 40 ships for us would mean not only do we have to double the base upkeep from 20 ships worth of upkeep to 40, but we then double it again. So it would cost four times as many energy credits and alloys to upkeep those ships as it would do if we just had 20. We can increase this number by building anchorages at star bases or getting soldiers on our planets. There are also some technologies and traditions that boost this further. All right, we've looked at about 3% of the screen now. Let's dive down just a little bit further. Next up here, we have our notification bar. This area is where all of your notifications about important things are going to come in. Hovering over them, it tells you what you need to do. And generally, if you click on the notification, it will take you to where you need to be. For example, we are not researching any physics research at the moment. If I click on this, it will take me to the technology screen where I can then choose a research option. How does technology work in Stellaris? Well, we are generating research points every month and technology has a research cost. We have to accumulate enough points over time and then eventually we will complete a technology. We can only research one technology at a time in each of three categories, physics, society, and engineering. We also get certain modifiers that boost our research output further in this case, our head of research here is granting a 2% bonus to research speed. So our 21.8 physics research is producing 22.24 progress per month. When you research a technology, you'll then get new research options to pick from. These are randomly drawn from a bag of possible research options available to your empire. There is a tech tree in the game. However, because of this random drawing nature, you aren't guaranteed to be able to progress up the tech tree directly. Increasing the number of research options is possible. You can take traditions, you can take civics, and you can get special leader traits that give us more research option availability, thus allowing us to specify better and navigate the research tree just a bit better. There's a great visual representation, which is slightly out of date, of the tech tree. To all intents and purposes, though, it's pretty much correct. I will put a link to that down in the description below if you'd like to check out the full tech tree to understand what happens. Techs basically come in one of six tiers. The opening tier, as you can see here, is tier one. This has a base cost of around 2000, but does scale up. We then get to tier two, that has a higher cost, tier three, tier four, and finally tier five. Beyond tier five, we end up in the repeatable technologies. This means the tech tree is infinite. Those repeatable technologies generally grant you a small bonus, but you can research them again and again and again for increasing cost. In order to get to the next tier, to be able to draw tier two technologies, we first have to research six tier one technologies. So we are limited in the technologies we have available to us right at the start. When it comes to choosing your technologies, there are a couple of different ways you can go. First off, early on, economic technologies are very important, like field modulation here. That will increase our energy output from all of the technician jobs we have all across our empire. But we must not neglect our military technologies. For example, fusion power here unlocks a component, the fusion reactor, that we can place on our ships. The fusion reactor grants us more power, allowing us to put more weapons, or at least weapons that require more power, onto our ships. 
In the society tree, you'll generally find technologies that increase your fleet command, naval capacity, unity, bureaucracy upkeep, as well as genetic technologies. Technologies like genome mapping allow us to modify our population growth. Population growth is a fundamental and important part of Stellaris. The more population growth you have, the larger your economy will be, and therefore, the more powerful your empire. Do not neglect population growth. Finally, engineering allows us to build generally bigger ships. It has some weaponry and also allows us to build bigger star bases. Mega engineering, a late game technology allowing us to build things like Dyson spheres and matter decompressors is also in this research tree. Generally, I would say engineering is the most powerful and important tree, followed by physics, and finally, society coming in behind, as a great deal of economic technologies are in the physics and engineering trees. On the left-hand side, we have a menu. I'm going to come back to this menu, but basically this allows us to get to various different controlling aspects of our empire. On the right, we have the outliner. Now, importantly, you can modify how the outliner works, where things go in the outliner. For example, if you'd like shipyards to be all the way at the very top, you can do that by simply moving them around. We also have multiple tabs here. The first is for government, showing our planets and shipyards. The next is for ships, that shows civilian and military fleets. And you will get a few more tabs appear as you progress through the game. Looking at the bulk of the screen here, we are currently seeing the system view. Diving in, this shows us not just our homeworld here of Earth, but also the local star Sol, we can see where the starbase is, we can see our fleet, we can see we have a construction and a science ship ready and raring to go, and we can also see various resources out in this area. So for example, here we have two palace, which is highlighted with a mineral symbol and a five. This five is in green, meaning we are collecting that resource. This is done because we have an orbit around it, a mining station. On the other hand, Europa over here, which is a frozen world, has a two in white, and as you can see, there is no mining station above that. If you want to put a mining station there, you need to select a construction ship. You can either do that in the game by clicking on the construction ship or do it from your outliner and then right click on the planet and choose mining station. Building mining stations costs you minerals and they will have a monthly upkeep, but you will get an income from this. So that is good to do. You do want to put down mining stations where you can. Before we dive into Earth and take a massive look at planetary management, which is quite a big field, don't worry, we are going to go through it, let's take a look at the galaxy map. To get there, either I click on this button here at the bottom or press the M key. Here we are in the galaxy map. Zooming out, I can see the entire galaxy. Zooming back in a little bit closer, we can also see our star system here of Sol and other star systems around us. The way that star systems are connected in Stellaris is via something called a hyperlane. In order to travel across to a hyperlane, you must have a hyperdrive. Hyperdrives should be equipped on all of your ships unless you unequip them. But honestly, please don't do that. That will just be pain and there's no need. And then to move to another system, we simply need to select a fleet, either doing that in the outliner or by clicking on it here on the map, and then right click on the system we would like to travel to. Ships or fleets like the construction ship without an admiral or a scientist are unable to move to unknown systems. Unknown systems are systems which have no name on the map. They are systems we have absolutely no intel on and we basically don't know how to get there. To get there, we first have to scout out the area either by using a fleet with an admiral or by using a science ship with a scientist. We can also see in this map mode some important points. You can see an icon here which looks eerily like an orange version of the planet Earth. Hovering over that, we can see there is a potentially habitable world in the Alpha Centauri system, a continental world. This is very important. You need to find planets for your people to live on and to expand your empire. In order to expand to Alpha Centauri and colonize this world, we first have to survey it. To survey it, select the science ship, right click on Alpha Centauri or whichever system you need to go to, and select Survey System. We could alternatively as well, turn on science ship automation by clicking on the science ship automation button and making sure the explore and survey settings are set and then clicking start. Honestly though, I'd recommend you early on manually survey the systems you need to survey to find your habitable worlds. If you can't see any habitable worlds around you, it is a fair and valid option to instead of surveying, use the explore. 
Exploring means the ship will simply travel there and it will not attempt to survey, which takes quite a bit of time. When it gets there, you'll be able to see if there are any potentially habitable worlds and then possibly survey the system. We can also queue up multiple orders by holding down the shift key and then queuing up multiple orders. If we want to get rid of all of those orders, we can either press the stop by pressing hotkey H or select one new order without shift held down to overwrite all previous orders. I'm going to come back and look at what all of the buttons here do because some of them are going to be important, but more important for military fleet management. So I've queued up my science ship to survey Alpha Centauri. I'm going to take my construction ship and begin building a mining station on Mercury to mine this additional energy. Now that I've done that, it's time that we look at planetary management. To select a planet to manage it, either click on it in the system view, click on it in the outliner, or in the galaxy view, if you click on your flag here, it will bring you to the planetary management screen for the planets you own in that system. We've now selected Earth, and there's a lot of information to break down here. What on Earth is going on, if you'll pardon the pun? All right, from top to bottom here, we have the planet name. Clicking on that allows us to rename Earth. For example, we can now call it Bob if we want to. Then we have the planet's designation. Designation will affect some minor bonuses for the planet, and certain designation types also affect the jobs on offer on that planet. We can also see the planetary class. For example, this is a continental world and the maximum habitability of any species in our empire. Humans here have a habitability of 100%. That is the maximum possible habitability. You can't live better than absolutely perfectly on a planet. We can also see the planet size and planet capacity. Planet capacity is an important value. We want to have a high planetary capacity because that will affect our logistic pop growth. I'll get to what logistic pop growth is a little bit later. Next up, we have stability. If your stability is below 25, your planet may revolt. You need to keep your stability above 25. Above 50, and your planet will get bonuses for having high stability. 0.6% additional resources from jobs, trade value, and some extra immigration pull per point of stability above 50. Below 50, you will be penalized with a reduction in resources from jobs and trade value. And as I said, if you go below 25, you could have a revolt. If you have slaves, you need to make sure your stability doesn't dip below 40 because slaves revolt quite a bit earlier. Underneath that, we can see the current population. In this case, we have 32 pops and they are all human. Pops is an esoteric way of measuring population. They don't directly mean a certain number of people. It could be in this case, one pop is a few hundred million, but we really just don't know. Then we have the decisions tab. Decisions are special decisions you can make on your planet by paying some sort of cost and then getting some modifiers or a bonus. For example, if we have some crime, we can spend 250 unity and launch an anti-crime campaign and thereby reduce crime per employed enforcer at the cost of a little bit of extra enforcer upkeep. Underneath that, we have the resettlement tab. As long as we have allowed resettlement in our policies, which as an egalitarian xenophile, we've currently not done that by default, then we can forcibly resettle population from one planet to another. This generally costs energy credits and unity, but it is instantaneous and allows us to move people around. Below that point, we now have crime, housing, amenities, current unemployment, and available jobs. Crime represents how much crime there is on the planet. If your crime is above 30%, negative events could fire that further increase crime and give you other debuffs on the planet. For example, a drug trade could happen, a gang war, you could get increase to crime becoming normalized, meaning you get criminal jobs. Crime generally reduces stability, which is bad for your economy, and reduces trade value. That's at least what most of the bonuses, or should I say penalties, will do. Housing represents how much housing we have for our population. You need to keep your housing above the pop housing needs. One of the best ways to get housing is through city districts, but generally all districts do increase your housing slightly and your capital also increases your housing as well. Amenities represents fulfilling the day-to-day -day happiness needs of your population. Your pops will have an amenities usage or upkeep and you will generate amenities from some jobs, from bonuses like the Empire Capital here, which generates 10 amenities, and from your planetary administration, as well as some buildings and some traits on your leaders. 
having an amenities above your usage means you get a citizen pop happiness bonus. Having amenities below your amenities usage negatively impacts your citizens by reducing their happiness. Generally, you do want to keep your amenities positive, but it's not a terrible problem if it goes negative as long as you don't have your stability below 50. Keeping your stability above 50 is good because it means you won't get any negative modifiers and because stability is affected by the happiness or approval of your population, an easy way to boost low stability is to increase your net amenities. Available jobs tells you how many open jobs there are on your planet. Generally, you don't want there to be more than one or two available jobs because that is just needless upkeep. In order to have available jobs, you have to build districts and buildings, and these require some form of upkeep. So having excess available jobs really is very, very pointless. You'll be paying extra upkeep, but getting no economic benefit. Unemployment, however, should always be at zero except for a few crazy strategies. If you have unemployment, you'll want to build a new district or building to create new jobs that those pops can then work. Certain pops and species with different rights can only work certain types of jobs. I will get onto citizen rights a little bit later, but be warned, it's possible to have available jobs and unemployment at the same time because certain citizens will refuse to work jobs beneath their station or be unable to work jobs above their station. That's the top half done, now let's look at the bottom half. Here we have the districts. Each district on our planet is represented by a fully colored square. Available districts are represented by colored empty squares. Possible districts that are unavailable due to planet size or capacity are represented by grayed out squares. And districts which are currently unavailable due to a tile blocker are represented here by a blocked square with a diagonal pattern on. Districts provide housing and generally a couple of jobs. The only exception to that is the city district, which is special in that it provides less jobs, only one clerk, but it also provides you with a building slot where you can build a building. Buildings provide generally no housing, they simply provide jobs. The exceptions to that are the capital, which provides housing and amenities as well as jobs, and the luxury residence building which provides no jobs at all but boosts your housing and your amenities. In order to construct a new district, we simply have to click on the district type we would like and then click build. We do have to have enough minerals to do that, so you will need to wait and save up your income in order to build new districts. We can also demolish districts if we no longer want to have them and replace them with a different type of district. Building buildings is generally the same. Click on an open available building slot and then select the building you would like to place. There are a variety of different building categories. Government buildings generally provide enforcers and reduce crime. Resource buildings generally provide you some sort of bonus to your basic resource output. Manufacturing buildings generally provide you some sort of bonus to your advanced resource output. That is alloys, consumer goods, and the special resources we mentioned earlier. Research buildings increase your research. Trade buildings provide you jobs that increase your trade value. Trade value is a special resource that only normal biological empires have access to. Trade value is a special resource that only normal biological empires have access to. Hive mind and machine intelligence empires do not benefit from trade at all. You generate trade through your population's jobs, for example, clerks and traders, as well as your basic population living will generate some trade value passively all the time. You can increase trade value with certain modifiers, for example, Xenophile here, and high stability is granting us a boost to our base trade value, and that's ending up with a net of 41 trade value. At the start of the game, trade value is directly converted into energy credits at a one-to-one -one ratio. As we progress, we may unlock different trade policies, allowing us to convert trade into other things like consumer goods or unity alongside some energy credit production. Generally though, these trade policies reduce our energy output and increase some other resource just a bit per trade value. Amenities buildings like hollow theaters provide you with jobs like entertainers that boost your amenities and unity for some consumer good upkeep or luxury residences that simply just generate amenities without requiring any pops. Luxury residences, if you have the available building slots, are probably better because we want to use our pops for producing resources 
rather than producing amenities most of the time. Pop efficiency is king to having a great economy in Stellaris. Following that we have Unity. We have administrative offices that provide bureaucrats that convert consumer goods into Unity. If you're a spiritualist empire, administrative offices are replaced with temples. Temples basically do exactly the same, but also provide some amenities and a little bit of spiritualist ethics attraction. There are also culture monuments. The culture building is generally just straight up better than the administrative building. Yes, it requires slightly more consumer goods upkeep, but it grants you a whole host of extra bonuses as well, along with more Unity production and basic production simply for the building existing. Last but not least, we have the army buildings. They are things like strongholds or fortresses that provide soldier jobs. Soldier jobs boost our naval capacity, stability, and spawn defensive armies, making our planets able to defend themselves against invading forces. In order to clear these blockers, and also the blockers here, to increase the total number of districts we have at our disposal, we'll need to go to the features tab, and there at the top you can see the possible blockers that are here. To clear the blockers on your capital, you'll generally only need to spend energy credits. Later on, to clear blockers on alien worlds, you'll need to do some research, as it requires a little bit more advanced knowledge to clear those blockers. They are also generally a little bit more expensive. The sprawling slum, when cleared, generates one pop. This is honestly the first blocker you should ever clear, and you should always spend the energy credits on this to get an additional pop as soon as you can. If we were to add a building to the building queue, it would appear here. We can add multiple buildings to the building queue and change which building is being built first. Each planet can only build one building at a time, however. So if you queue up 10 buildings, don't expect them to all be built at once. Here we can see that Earth is in the core sector. This is our capital sector. And we could, if we wanted to, edit the sector. I'll get to sector editing a bit later. We also have a colony designation. At the beginning, with all colonies, they will be set to automatic designation. If you click on the planet with the cogwheel, we can also manually set the designation. This allows us to change the bonuses we are getting on this world. And in the case of the forge or factory capital, that will also have an impact on the industrial districts. Generally, industrial districts provide one artisan and one metallurgist job. If I change to a forge capital, that changes to just two metallurgist jobs, but no artisans. And if I go to factory capital, that does the inverse. Being on any other type of capital or any other type of world means that it will be one of each. Below trade value, we can see our total net planetary production. We can also see what our planet is in deficit of. Don't worry too much about this area because it doesn't really matter a planet is in deficit of a resource as long as your empire overall is not in deficit of that resource. If you want to see the full breakdown of production versus upkeep, you can hover over it and you'll get a view like this. Honestly though, don't worry about this too much. It's really not a big deal. Before we move on to the population tab, I do need to mention the leader and also any bonuses on the planet. Here we have the Prosperous Unification modifier. This, as you can see, will expire in 20 years time. It's granting us some happiness, some amenities and resources from jobs. Other modifiers that affect our planets will appear here, so you can click on a planet and then find out what might be going on, positive or negative, to that world. We can also set leaders to be governors on our planets. There are different types of leaders, but basically, they will have an effect depending on whether they are the governor of the sector capital, in this case our capital is always a sector capital, or if they're just the governor of a random planet in a sector. Also, depending on their class, they will have other effects as well, and their traits will have effects possibly on the planet they're on or other planets in their sector. I'll get on to leaders just a little bit later. The population tab is where we can micromanage the population of our worlds and the jobs they are working. Here we can see the different strata of population. We have the ruling class, the specialist class, kind of the middle classes, and the working class, the bottom of the pyramid. Depending on our species rights, different classes of workers will get different upkeeps in terms of consumer goods and get different bonuses or penalties to happiness and different political power. Combining the living standard with the number of population at a certain level provides us with a pop approval because population has political power. Multiplying that political power weighting by their approval then lets us work out the value of pop approval planet-wide. As you can see here, the workers are actually quite powerful with 54% of the political power. That's probably because there's so many of them. 
Whereas just our two rulers here, that represent much less than 10% of the population, are getting 12% of the political power. Other species' rights can grant more political power to rulers or less. It really depends what kind of legal system your empire follows. Pop approval is affected by the happiness of individual pops, as I mentioned. If you'd like to see an individual pop and see its happiness, you can expand one of these stratas and then click on one of the pops. Here we have two human politician pops. We can see that their happiness here is at 92%. These are all the factors affecting it. Prosperous unification, that is the modifier here. Idealistic foundation, that's one of our civics. Infinite opportunities, that's an agenda that's fired. High amenities, so this net amenities is boosting happiness further. As well as decent conditions, which is the living standard of the population. Here we also get to view their political power. This is multiplied by six from the base of one due to their ruler strata, which as I said is affected by the living standard. We also see some other stats about this pop. The crime it produces, the empire size it generates, the housing needs it has, generally that's one, and the amenities usage it has, generally that's also one, as well as its production and upkeep. It is producing nine unity, that is from a base of six multiplied by some bonuses and three amenities. It also has an upkeep of one, some of that is from living standards, and two of the consumer goods upkeep here is from its job. Politicians turn consumer goods into unity and a little bit of amenities. If we want to change which jobs our pops are working, we can decrease job priority. Now, if there's no other jobs available in the same strata, that will lead your pop to being unemployed. Unemployed pops will slowly, over time, move to the strata below them. But it does take quite a bit of time before they will agree that they are no longer ruling class and instead they are some other class. Generally, you don't want to fiddle too much with increasing or decreasing job priorities. The only exception to that is probably decreasing the number of clerks you've got to make your pops work other jobs, because other jobs are generally better than clerks. Except, unfortunately, the enforcer job. That was a little silly of me. But luckily, I should be able to unemploy that enforcer. And because it just moved up from working class, when we unpause, it should move down instantly rather than deciding it is a specialist class pop. We can here now see all of the different jobs that are available and currently being worked by pops on this planet where we have 32 pops. We have two researchers, two bureaucrats, a trader, two metallurgists, two artisans, four clerks, six technicians, four miners, and six farmers. On the right here, we can also see how our population is growing. Here we have a human pop growing at a rate of plus 3.62 points per month. When we hit the maximum capacity of growth progress, that's 108, a new pop will be created. You can see here that will be in 30 months. All pop growth has a base of three. It can be modified as a, in a percentage by technology. We can also increase the base output, and that is the logistic pop growth, by increasing our planetary capacity relative to our current population. At the moment, we have 48 planet capacity and 32 pops. To increase planetary capacity, you can either clear tile blockers, which will add four planetary capacity apiece, or add additional districts like city districts that have more housing than four. Open tiles, like the two open ones we have here, add four planetary capacity, unless the planet is a tomb world, in which case they only add three, or a Gaia world, in which case they add a whopping six. So clearing these early blockers is a good route to increasing your early population growth. Don't forget to do that. Next to that, we have assembly. In order to get pop assembly, we either need to be building robots or have some way of cloning pops or some other method of biological pop assembly. Finally, the last section here that you never want to see is pop decline. If we have species that we are trying to purge, that is exterminate on our planet or simply get rid of them, they will show up in the purge category and be removed. Also, if we are unable to support our population, we could see a declining population and that would mean we'd see some pops going away. That can only generally happen if we have negative housing, negative food, negative everything. It's bad, bad to see pop decline. Try not to see it. We also, as I mentioned, we can see demographics as well as seeing what percentage of the population on this world follow individual edicts. 43% follow egalitarian and 56% are xenophile. Individual pops can only be of one specific ethic, as you can see here. Next up, we have the army tab. First, we can see our garrison, our planetary defense armies, increasing our capital, getting more enforcers, or getting more soldier jobs increases the number of defense armies. We can also recruit using minerals, assault armies. 
As the game goes on and you get more technologies, you'll unlock different types of armies that are more powerful than the basic assault army. When recruiting an assault army, if we don't uncheck the deploy in orbit button, the assault armies won't be added to the planetary defense. Instead, they'll end up in orbit and we can use them to invade. We can also use the embark all button to embark all assault armies on the planet. Defense armies can never leave though, they are always stuck there. Here we can also add a general to the planet if we'd like to do that. That would buff the military power of the armies on the planet. Last up, we have the holdings tab. Unless you are a mega corporation, or you have a deal with a mega corporation, you have a vassal, or you are a vassal, this screen will do absolutely nothing. However, in those cases, special buildings can be built here. And if you're a vassal, or if someone else has a commercial pact with you and they're a megacorp, they may build buildings on your world that will create some possible jobs for you, but also give them an economic advantage. There's one more thing I haven't mentioned, and that's planetary automation. Early on, I'd recommend when you're getting to grips with a game, you don't turn on planetary automation. You try to build the districts yourself and work out what's going on. Planetary automation can be manipulated using the setting here to choose what is and is not automated. There's a lot of depth here. And generally, it's not the best. It can do some weird and wacky things. It does require quite a bit of fine tuning to understand what it will do and make it do the right things. When you have too many planets to manage though, if you get up to 10 or 20 worlds, you'll probably want to turn on planetary automation on a bunch of them and just keep managing your core worlds that have high economic output. I do have a video that covers planetary automation in more detail. I'll leave a link to that down in the description below if you're interested in planetary automation. Down on the bottom left here, we've got hotkeys and key binding. To select one of your hotkeys, for example, here we've got our capital, we've got a military fleet, we've got a science ship, we've got a construction ship. Simply click on it, or double click to go to. Say I want to see where this science ship is, I can double click on it and it will now bring it within view. You can also clear a hotkey by right clicking on it and by pressing control and a number, you can add it to your hotkey tab. In the bottom of the center here, we can see the name of the system we are in. We can rename the system if we want to. We can see the empire who this system belongs to. For us, it is the United Nations of Earth. Well done us. And we can go to the galaxy map or jump back into the system view. On the right hand side here, we have a whole host of features for changing how the galaxy map works. We can either view the galaxy in a unions map mode. This means political unions, so subjects and federations will all be displayed in the same color. I generally recommend you leave that on to understand what the power blocks are. We can also turn on and off the hyperlanes. Generally keep them on, you need to know where they go. We can also turn on sectors map mode. Only do that if you're trying to edit the sectors. Or we can change between diplomatic map mode. This allows us to see the diplomatic relation we have with another empire. Intel map mode to see how much intelligence we have on them. Opinion to see whether or not they like us. AI attitude to see if they're an AI empire, what their attitude is towards us. And neighbor map mode to see which empires are considered our neighbors. We can also go to the trade routes map mode, which is a special map mode that allows us to set trade routes. I'll go into trade routes a little bit later when our empire has expanded just a bit. Below that, we can also toggle details map mode. If I turn that on, it basically continues to show us any resources we are currently collecting, whereas by turning it off, it only shows us possible resources that we have yet to collect in our systems. Underneath that, we have a go to. We have a search if you'd like to search for a specific system. If you're in multiplayer, there is a chat. The help button if you're on Steam will take you to uh, the wiki page, I'm pretty sure. And finally, we have the main menu where you can save, load, change the settings, like for example, gameplay, sound, messages, accessibility, all of that kind of juiciness, or leave to menu or exit to desktop. Before I explain all of the menus here on the left hand side, it's actually going to be better to start the game running. I've queued up some orders here. We've got the science ship UNS Ptolemy that's going to go out surveying. I'm also going to shift click to get it to survey Zerk as well after it's done that. And I'm going to unpause. Now that we've unpaused, as you can see, things are happening. Time is moving and our ships are moving around. If I pause again, suddenly time stands still and I can, if I wish, issue new orders. I can, of course, change orders while time is running, but, but generally in the early game, when you're getting to grips in your first few games, you'll probably want to pause the game every time you want to do something or make an action or change. We've now got over 300 energy credits, so I'm going to clear the sprawling slum. To do that, I'll open features. Look at the sprawling slum. This is the one that gives us a pop. Click clear blocker. It will now appear in the building queue. And when I unpause, you'll see the time to completion tick down. Looking up at our resources here, you'll see that we're making lots of energy credits, but relatively not that many minerals and barely any consumer goods. 
This is something we should do something about. Now, we have access to an internal market, and later on, we will get a galactic market when the galactic community or galactic senate forms. To access the market, we can either go to the market tab, which is on the bottom here on the left, or click on one of the resources. I'm going to click on the mineral resource. Within this market, we can see the resources we are producing. In that case, it's minerals, food, consumer goods, and alloys. You don't see energy credits, and that is because energy credits are a medium of exchange. Think of it as money. We can't buy money with money, but we can sell items for money. There are two ways of buying and selling. The first way is to click here and buy amounts in a specific number. Another way is to add a monthly trade. To add a monthly trade, we simply click on monthly trade, choose if it's a buy or sell order, choose the resource we want, and then how many each month we'd like to buy. Every time you buy or sell a resource, it will affect the market price. Basic resources like food and minerals start at a price of one, consumer goods start at a price of two, and alloys start at a price of four energy credits. Over time, if we are not buying or selling, the prices will return to these default values. However, if we sell more alloys, for example, than 10, we will be changing the price. The numbers of these resources here are the maximum numbers you can buy each month without changing the base price. Important to note that the market also takes a fee of at maximum 30%. We can reduce that to a minimum of 5% later on though. And that fee is either added into the cost when we're buying something like an alloy, that's why it costs 5.2, or reduced from our sell price. That's why we can only sell it at 2.8. That is the base value modified by the market fee of 30%. I would recommend rather than just willy nilly clicking the buy or sell options, you instead use the buy or sell orders. The maximum number of resources we can sell without affecting the price is also here on screen if you'd like to see. That's 50 minerals and food, 25 consumer goods, and 13 alloys. There are also maximums for the rare resources, but given we're not producing any right now, we can't buy them or sell them. We're currently making 82 energy credits, so I'm going to buy 30 minerals per month and 10 consumer goods. Whilst we can't really spend consumer goods on anything, there is one item we can buy which early on is very important and that is colony ships. If I select my star base with a shipyard and go to the shipyard tab, we can then see which ships are available to be built. We can build military ships, construction ships, colony ships, or science ships. The cost here is listed and the time it takes to produce them. As you can see, colony ships require 200 food, consumer goods, and alloys. We'll need a colony ship in order to colonize any of the planets. Let's quickly now look at how star bases work. So star bases have modules and buildings. As you increase the size of your star bases, which requires technology, for example, to increase to a star hold from this star port, we need the star hold technology along with a whole bunch of alloys that will unlock more module and more building slots. Each star base size unlocks two more modules and one building slot with the final size, the Citadel, unlocking only an extra module. If we click on the details, we can also see the weapons and defenses on our starbase, along with the number of hull points, armor, and shields it has. These statistics combine together to give us the military power of the starbase. Here you can see the power is 701. As we upgrade the starbase, we'll get more things on it. Even if we don't put more modules, we'll get more weapons and defenses, and that will increase the military power of the starbase. However, we can also add military modules like the gun battery here, which increases ship hull points, armor hit points, protection range, defense platform cap, and gives us two medium sized weapon slots on the starbase, which will add into these other three that we already have. Starbases generally have an overestimation of their military power because they have such high health and armor. Do not expect a starbase of 700 to go toe to toe with a military fleet of equivalent military power. In terms of the modules we have at our disposal at the start, we have only a few basic ones. The shipyard, which allows us to build ships, giving us one shipyard capacity. Additional shipyards allow us to build multiple ships simultaneously in the shipyard tab. We also have anchorages. Those increase our naval capacity. Each anchorage increases it by four, so that would take us from 20 to 24 if we built an anchorage. Gun batteries, which increase the defensiveness of star bases. And finally, trade hubs. Trade hubs do something a little weird. They increase trade collection range. I'll get onto how trade works a little bit later, but basically this allows your star bases to collect more trade value if it is out there available to be collected and currently uncollected. Trade, as you know, is created by planets, but also we get some modifiers in space creating trade as well. On the building side of things, we've got a lot more options. 
we'll start off with a crew quarters here that reduces our docked ship upkeep by 25%. If we bring our fleet back and get them to enter orbit of the starbase, you can either do that by clicking the return or right clicking on a starbase and clicking enter orbit. When they get there, their icon will change and their upkeep will decrease. Looking over at this military fleet, if I hover over one of these ships, you'll see that it has an energy upkeep of 0.88 and an alloy upkeep of 0.20. Putting it into dock reduces that by 25%. It's very good to keep all of your fleets in dock when you can. Other starbase buildings include things like the resource silo, which increases our total resource storage capacity. At the start, our resource storage capacity is 15,000 for every type of resource, except energy credits, which is 50,000. Unity is unlimited and research storage is also unlimited, you should note. So resource silos can be very useful if you're getting near that maximum capacity, but cannot spend a specific resource. Otherwise, we have lots of different types of military buildings that change things like here we have the communications jammer reducing enemy sublight speed and combat disengagement chance in the system. We can improve the defenses of a starbase without putting extra modules on by building additional defensive stations. They will spawn adjacent to the starbase and basically sit there and defend it forever. When they are killed, you will have to spend alloys to replace them though. The other tab is the army builder tab. If you'd like to build armies in an entire sector rather than queuing them up on a planet, you can do that here. Also by selecting control and clicking, you can get multiple armies being built at the same time. Armies are used to invade and defend planets. So they're basically a wartime asset. Once you've accumulated enough unity points, you can then purchase traditions. To look at traditions, you either need to go to society management or click on the unity button here. Alternatively, when this icon pops up, you can also click on the tradition. Now, we have a total of seven possible tradition slots in our empire. Every time we select a tradition, the cost of the next tradition pick goes up. But that shouldn't be too much of a challenge for you. As long as you continue to scale your Unity production with game time, you'll find you keep unlocking traditions at roughly the same rate. When it comes to traditions, there are a whole host of traditions. Honestly, pick whatever you'd like. Early game expansion and discovery can be quite useful if you'd like to boost your colony starting size or you'd like to be doing more surveying and more exploration. I have a full tier list going through what every single tradition does and which ones are good and which ones are bad. I'll link that down in the description below if you'd like some more details on traditions. And if you're enjoying this video, please Stellaris that like button. As we explore out into the galaxy, events will happen. For example, here we have discovered our first signs of alien life on Alpha Centauri 3. That's because Alpha Centauri is a continental world. It has life on it and we've discovered it, we are not alone now. Sometimes events will have multiple choices. In this case, there's only one choice, and that is we understand something's happened and we get a bonus. When you choose the outcome of an event, it will probably provide you with different bonuses or different resources depending on which outcome you choose. Some events are in a chain, so choosing one outcome precludes future events from firing and may mean other events fire. You may also find anomalies out there in the galaxy. Anomalies require a scientist on a science ship to research them. They will have a difficulty level from 1 to 10, and based on the level of your scientist, for example, this scientist is level 2, that will change how long it takes to complete the anomaly. Low-level scientists researching high-level anomalies will take forever. Don't try it. If you'd like to complete the anomaly and get whatever happens at the end of it, usually an event will fire, sometimes you'll get a bonus, then you need to click research. You can also leave the anomaly for now and if we turn on details map mode or select a science ship, you can see the anomaly on the galactic map. While having a science ship selected, if I simply right click on the anomaly, that will mean I'll send a scientist off to research that anomaly. Once you have fully surveyed a system, you can then expand your empire and add it to your collection. To do that, you'll need to select a construction ship and then right click on the system and build a starbase. This type of starbase is just an outpost. It's the lowest level of starbase and does not contribute towards our starbase capacity whatsoever. Here you can see that anomaly has given us 221 unity, which is nice. And both of these basically do the same thing. We get a terraforming candidate. If you want to keep track of your anomalies, you need to go to the situation log and then you can click on the anomalies tab and see in that tab every single anomaly you have yet to complete. Also in the situation log, you'll see any special projects, event chains or situations that are ongoing in your empire. 
At the start of the game, these should be completely empty, but as we do more research, as we survey further out into the galaxy, both of these will start to fill up. The final tab here is the victory screen, which basically breaks down a specific score for us. You can pretty much ignore this unless you're going for a score victory at 2500. I've jumped ahead a little bit, don't worry. This is roughly what it looks like later on when you've got quite a few different anomalies and different situations ongoing. For example, here I could study the Nema by researching the project. The same here. I don't want to do that because it's going to cost 3,000 physics research, which is 53 months worth of physics. And while I'm doing this special project, I won't be able to research any other physics technology. So do be careful about the costs of the special projects you do. Below the situation log, we have the government tab. Now I've just completed my first agenda by clicking on it when it was here. I had a pop-up that told me to fire it and that completed the infinite opportunities agenda. Once an agenda is completed for 10 years, you will get the launched modifier effect. In this case, I get a 10% bonus to citizen pop happiness empire wide. I can then set another agenda. Agendas are special directives or goals your ruling council or the ruling elite of your civilization are working towards. You only have a few agendas available. Now, these are based on the ethics of your empire, as well as the traditions you've taken. For example, expansion has unlocked the superior colonies agenda for us. Early on, the, the most powerful agenda to do pretty much straight away is going to be to expand the council. Having more council members increases your agenda speed. The agenda speed or agenda progress is basically 10 per council member plus their level. So in this case, our combined speed is 42. Once we have accumulated enough progress, this will then be available to fire. I can click on it and the launch effect will happen. In this case, I will unlock one councillor slot, which is this locked slot over here, allowing me to put another leader on my council, thus unlocking future agendas faster but also I'll get another special position, another council position, giving me more bonuses in the empire. As time goes on, as your leaders do things, they'll also level up. Here I can see Dolores Mwanga has an, has an available trait pick. If I click on this, I will get to pick one from a number of traits. There are different types of traits. At the top here, you can see a councillor trait. Councillor traits affect your entire empire, but only work if that leader is on the council. Otherwise you have traits that affect just the leader or whatever they're managing. In this case, Righteous would affect any planets or sectors that that leader is governing. I'm going to select I for Talent to get some extra juicy leader experience gain. Hovering over this bar, I can see the leader skill level. In this case, it's two. I can see the experience needed for the next skill level, 1,100, and its current experience, 28. Every month as a member of the council, you'll get additional experience gain but leaders also gain experience from doing jobs like working as a governor or surveying out in the galaxy. Once you get to level eight, you'll unlock something called a destiny trait, which is a super powerful trait that your leader can only have one of. Also from this council screen, we can see the possible edicts we have at our disposal. Edicts require some unity per month to upkeep, but we have a special thing called edict fund at our disposal. Edict fund is basically free unity we can only spend on edicts. If we do not spend it, it is not added to our unity production. So if your edict fund is greater than the possible edict cost you could run, you might as well turn on a couple of edicts. Here I'm going to turn on Fortify the Border. That will increase my starbase upgrade speed and increase my starbase capacity by two when I unpause. That costs us 15 edict fund per month and it does not decrease our total unity production. We've also discovered the signs of some aliens in the Zerk system, so we can begin a first contact. Lots of events just fired, that tells us lots of flavor. You should read through all of the events. Basically, it tells you so much flavor and theme and context as to what is happening in the universe. This is the first contact screen. If I select an envoy, I can pick any of these. These are kind of like special dummy leaders that don't really do anything, don't have any traits and don't matter. If they die, we get a new one instantly for free. The only thing that does matter is our total number of envoys, thus deciding how many different special projects like this we can do at once. The way first contact works is every unit of time, so in this case 80 days, we will roll a die. That die roll will basically every month either advance this situation, this first contact, or give us some insights. If we advance, we get to the next stage. If we get insights, it makes the chance of advancing or getting a breakthrough better. This is simply a waiting game. You put the envoy in and you have to wait until first contact is completed. 
Now that I've built an outpost of Alpha Centauri, it is within our borders. Once a system is within your borders, you can then start colonizing the planet. To colonize a planet, either select it and click the colonize button, then you can get the nearest starbase to start building a colony ship, or if you've already built a colony ship, you can select the colony ship and send it over to the world. One other alternative is to select the colony ship, right click on the planet and click colonize planet. We can then either name it ourselves or pick a random name from our name list. This process of surveying, building an outpost and then colonizing with colony ships is how you expand your empire and increase the number of planets you are living on. Jumping back to the government tab, on the other side of the edicts we have the policies. Here are all of the laws, this is the legal system of your empire. You can open up one of the policies and see what the possible available options are. Some of these policies simply give you a modifier, for example, the economic policy modifies your output of consumer goods or alloys in one direction or another. Militarized means we produce less consumer goods and more alloys. Civilian means we produce more consumer goods and less alloys. Diplomatic stance changes how you interact with other empires in the galaxy and gives you lots of other modifiers. This basically changes how much it costs in terms of your influence or manner to send envoys to improve or harm relations, or possibly it increases your diplomatic weight in the galactic community, possibly it increases your naval capacity, reducing war exhaustion and claim cost. It really depends on what you pick. You start off on expansionist, which is kind of okay for, incre for reducing outpost build cost and increasing colony development speed, but it's not really very great. You'll want to switch over to either isolationist straight away for more additional unity, or go for cooperative or belligerent if you want more naval capacity, or you want everyone to like you just a little bit more. Other diplomatic stances can become available if you have the prerequisites. Sometimes they will be traditions, other times they are locked behind civics. Some laws will also decide what kind of people are allowed to live within our empire. The robotic workers law allows you to decide whether robot workers are allowed or entirely outlawed. If they're outlawed and you have some, you will disassemble them. You can also allow slavery, allow purging, turn on population controls, all sorts of important legal things that define the basis of who your empire are and what they are doing. Beyond this, we also have the rights of individual species in the empire. First, you can set the default rights for any type of alien that you come across, any new alien that joins your empire, either through migration or possibly through conquest, will get the default rights. You can also set the rights of individual species in your empire. Note that your starting species can never be anything other than full citizens. First up we have the citizenship laws. Full citizens can produce leaders. Pops that are residents only will have a reduction in happiness, but a massive reduction to political power and pop amenities usage. That can be very useful if they are recently conquered. And if you don't like the traits they have, because some of these traits will affect leaders and what abilities leaders have, as well as their cost, how fast they level up, you may want to set them to residents only so that they cannot produce any leaders. Slaves cannot produce leaders and are enslaved. That massively reduces their happiness and also their consumer goods usage. Finally, undesirables is the species right set for any species that is being purged. Living standards defines the quality of life and political power balance of your species. At the top end, we have utopian abundance where everybody, no matter the class, is basically equal but it requires a massive, a phenomenally massive amount of upkeep in terms of consumer goods. Everybody in a utopian abundance living standard society lives as good as the ruling classes in other civilizations, basically. And further down, we have things like academic privilege. If you are materialist, you can do this. Social welfare, that is a slight increase in consumer goods usage for workers with an additional increase for their political power. All the way down the bottom here, we have stratified economy. Stratified economy is something you might not be able to imagine. It's basically a society where the ruling classes prioritize their own living standards at the expense of the working class. Those working classes get reduced political power and don't use as many consumer goods. And the ruling classes are very, very happy and have lots of political power and consumer goods. If the workers wish to better their lot in life, they will simply have to work for it. This is only available if you are an authoritarian empire. Basic subsistence is not available to full citizen species, only slaves and residents, and this means that the population generally get just enough to get by. Workers and slaves have low happiness, rulers have reduced happiness, but the consumer goods upkeep is minimal. Slaves have absolutely no consumer goods upkeep at this level. 
Non-existent is only for species that are being displaced or being neutered. Military service defines whether or not this species can produce armies, or if at full military service, whether they can produce commanders as well. Colonization rights defines whether or not the planet colonization rights defines whether or not you're allowed to build colony ships with that species. Generally, you should always turn on colonization to allow. There's no harm in allowing colonization. The pops won't just colonize by themselves. You do have to actively build a colony ship. If you turn on population controls, that type of pop will stop growing. They'll get reduced happiness, but if it's a pop you don't want to have lots of in your empire, if they're a fungus that are growing out of control, you may wish to turn on population controls. Migration controls prevent pops from emigrating between planets in your empire, and if you have migration treaties with other empires, it stops them emigrating to those empires as well. Generally, this is defined as a bonus or a reduction in your pop growth. If you have no migration treaties though, there is no need to turn on migration controls because it is a zero-sum game, unless you've got some traits which could boost it, for example. We have the nomadic trait which boosts pop growth from immigration by 15%. Pop immigration on one world will be balanced out by immigration on another of your own world, so you're not actually losing pop growth, you're just getting more growth on the smaller worlds, which allows them to uh, become fully functional colonies quicker. If I had slavery policy allowed or purge policy allowed, which I can't because I am xenophile and egalitarian, I could choose the slavery type. There are a number of different slavery types. Each type of slavery changes which jobs the slaves are able to work, as well as sometimes providing bonuses or special types of jobs. The different purge types also defines how you are exterminating or removing the population. The simplest and nicest way is just displacement. You simply remove them from your world. You forcibly resettle them to somewhere else. The harshest type is death squad extermination, where you kind of go around and gas them all. Don't worry though, this game has a low age rating. Something else you might come across as you explore the galaxy is the archaeology sites. Archaeology sites are basically exactly what you might think. They are areas of archaeological interest, and they function in pretty much the same way as a first contact. They have a difficulty, you get a skill bonus now though from the leader assigned to them, and in order to assign someone, you have to get a scientist to go over there. So, we can select a scientist who will come there in a science ship and start doing the archaeology site. As you unlock different chapters, you'll get different bonuses, different things will happen. Mainly though, you'll get a lot of minor artifacts. Once you have finally completed a first contact project, you can then initiate first contact and communications with an alien species. Here we've met the Feralian Confederation. They are egalitarian, fanatic xenophile, so they actually complement us very well. We can see their AI personality is Federation Builders, so they might want to form a federation with us relatively soon. That could be good. We can then respond to their greetings. The first option will improve relations. The second doesn't really do anything except reduces their ability to build a spy network within us. The third option harms relations but increases our ability to spy on them. Generally, I would recommend right at the start you improve relations with all of these AI empires. You don't want them declaring war on you. If we want to come back and speak to these aliens, we can now initiate proper diplomatic proceedings. To do that, either in the main map, just click on one of their icons here like this, that brings you to the screen, or you can go to the contact screen where you can see all of the different alien races, different alien powers you've made contact with. From there, you can click Diplomacy and get to the Diplomacy screen as well. We have lots of options that we can do here. We can send envoys to improve relations. I think I'll do that. We can build a spy network. I might also do that as well. Building a spy network I'll get to in a moment, but first, we can do even more things. We can declare war from here if we have claims on their systems, which we can get by going to the claim tab and using our influence to click on these and then make claims. We could claim some systems. I don't want to do that though. These are possibly our friends. If we were superior to them in terms of our relative power, we could also demand that they become our tribute or vassalize them through a war goal. And if they are our rival, we could declare a humiliate war against them. All of these war goals will allow you to get your claims from the enemy. So if you claim any of their star systems or planets and you complete the war, you'll get those claims as well. But you do need to have a Cassus Belly in order to go to war. We can also offer a trade deal, allowing us to trade our resources or our systems or some information for their resources, systems and information. Generally, the AI will never trade away their systems, so don't even bother. 
you can trade away yours and they'll basically give you a few energy credits for it. It's, it's really not worth it. What can be worth it is trading resources you don't need much of, like, for example, food, in order to increase the relationship. You could also just sell the resources to them like this in order to get stuff for your food. For example, here I could get some energy credits for my food. This, as you'll notice, is actually a higher rate than we could get in the market. So trading with alien empires can be quite useful if you'd like to get a bit of an economic advantage. Beyond that, we can form pacts. In order to form pacts, we need to have trust. Most pacts, like defensive, commercial, and research agreements, are locked away behind having trust forming an embassy, forming a non-aggression pact. These things will increase our trust over time. If I unpause here, you'll see that the AI has agreed to the non-aggression pact, the embassy, and done the trade deal. This means we're getting some trust every month. Beyond basic pacts, if we have the diplomacy tradition and plenty of trust, then we could form a federation if they'd like to do that. If we have lots of trust, we can also become their subject or propose they become our subject. This does still require, though, mostly for you to be more powerful than them. Last but not least, if you're harming relations and you really want them to hate you, you could send an insult. All of these changes I've been mentioning to relations affects the AI's attitude. At the beginning, the attitude starts at around zero, but it can go from minus 1500 to plus 1500. At above 750, we have excellent relations. Above 300, we just have positive. Between minus 300 and 300, we are technically neutral. Below 300, we are tense. And below 750, we are terrible. As you'll notice, to form a federation, we either have to have 30 trust or excellent relations. 30 trust is generally much easier to get to. Excellent relations, so if you want to form federations or other pacts, go for trust. After year 10, if we have found aliens, we'll generally also get factions forming. In order to look at our factions, we need to go to the government tab and then click on factions. Here you can see the various factions. Factions generally represent a specific ethic in your empire. The free citizen group is the egalitarian ethic and the Xenoist faction is mainly xenophile with some egalitarian stuff thrown in as well. Factions have an approval rating, a number of pops that support them. That can be shown both in terms of pop support percentage and the physical number of pops across our empire. They have an ethic. They have a number of issues, here they are, which we are either doing the right thing or we are pleasing them, in which case they are uh, blue. We are not pleasing them, in which case they are red. Or they could be yellow, in which case they are basically neutral on that uh, issue. The more issues that we get to be blue or green, honestly, I'm not sure what that color is, uh, then we get more faction approval. Faction approval above 50% gives us some bonuses. Above 60%, we get plus 5% happiness empire-wide for every pop in that faction. Above 80%, we get plus 10% happiness. Happiness, of course, improves your pop approval rating, thus improving stability. So increasing your happiness here through factions basically means all of your planets become slightly more effective and your economy is better. On top of that, factions will produce unity based on a mixture of their approval multiplied by their support and based on the size of your entire empire. That empire size is based on the total political power of all the pops in your empire. It's not based on the empire size up here at the top. Making your factions happy is a very, very important thing to do. Now, generally, we want the factions that are part of our core ethics. If I go over to the top here and click on our flag, we can just double check here that our governing ethics are fanatic, egalitarian, and xenophile. So we really want the fanatic, egalitarian, and xenophile factions to be happy. They are the factions that represent us. We can further promote a faction by going to Manage Faction and clicking Promote. This costs us nothing and increases the likelihood that a pop will drift in their ethics towards that faction. As long as an ethic is not fanatic and you have a support greater than 20%, for example, here we have the Alien Compassion Society have a support above 20% at 47 and they are also not fanatic, then we can embrace that faction. Embracing them would shift our ethics towards some other ethic. That is the only way that you can move your ethics around from your governing ethics. Having large factions in your empire with ethics that you then promote. Also, if a faction forms, 
and you really do not like that faction, for example, if we had the Xenophobe faction forming, we would find them very difficult to get approval on, we could suppress that faction. Suppressing a faction massively reduces their approval, generally goes down to 0%, meaning you get a minus 40% happiness negative on any member of that faction, but the attraction to that faction also goes down as well, so pops are less likely to join that faction and take up that ethic. Most of the issues that you have in your factions can be satiated by changing your policies around. For example, the Free Citizen Group would like us to change our policy of subjugation to benevolent subjugation. We can do that. If we go to subjugation war terms and click over to benevolent, you'll now see we've actually got completely 100% approval on every faction. That's granting us lots of unity and lots of additional happiness. Other ways of increasing it are representation on the council. Leaders, just like Pops, have an ethic that they follow. For example, Dolores Mwanga here follows egalitarianism, and Ives Temble follows Xenophile. If you put governors on planets with certain ethics, or you put leaders on your council with certain ethics, not only do you increase the attraction to that ethic, this can be a way of changing ethics if you hire leaders following different ethics, but also it generally fulfills the requirement of factions to be represented on the council. No taxation without representation is an ethos that all of these factions really take to heart. If I drop down to the leader tab, not only can we see the leaders we currently have in our empire, currently I'm looking at all, but we can also go to officials, commanders, and scientists. And I should mention those are the three types of leaders. Officials are generally best at governing planets, but they can also be sent to the galactic community or sent to a federation if you're a member to increase your diplomatic weight in the community, that is your voting weight, or increase the cohesion, that is basically affecting the experience gain, of the Federation. On planets, they're going to buff your resource output and reduce empire size from pops. On the planet they govern, they will grant a large bonus. They will grant half of that bonus per level. All of these effects here as well, you should note are per level. So a level three governor multiplies all of whatever these are by three times. If the governor is on a sector capital, they will also grant an effect to every other planet in the sector. For example, on Bob here, we have Queen Sima, who is a level two leader on the sector capital. Going to other planets, we can see we have a sector governor here, which is Quingsima, also granting bonuses to the other planets as well. If I go to the population tab, open up the metallurgist and click on one, you can see here I'm getting 2% additional alloy output from the governor skill. Whereas in the capital, that is doubled to be 4% additional alloy output from governor skill, because as you'll note, planet governors get 2% per level, whereas sector governor bonus is only 1% on the planet they're not directly governing. Any leader can actually govern planets though. Commanders are used to either boost your fleets, they can be attached to a fleet to add bonuses to the fleet. Those bonuses generally include fire rate and disengagement chances, or you can put them as a governor to in essence institute martial law. If you put a commander on a planet as a governor, you'll get a reduction in crime, you'll get more soldier jobs. If they're governing their home planet, you'll get some additional stability as well, but you will sacrifice specialist pop output and ruler pop output. That means you'll be producing less research, alloys, consumer goods, and uh, less unity from your politicians. You should generally only employ commanders as governors on planets dedicated entirely to basic resources. Workers and slaves get decent bonuses from these governors. The bonuses are pretty much equivalent to the regular governor bonus though, so having martial law is really only effective to stop low stability issues, because soldiers, don't forget, boost the stability on your planet, whilst also providing additional defense armies which can stave off rebellions. Scientists are the third class of leader. They are generally employed on science ships and can be sent off into the galaxy to explore anomaly. On top of that, they can also be on the council as the head of research and generally do other council type positions. If you employ them on a planet as a governor, they can also boost the research output of that planet. This is basically one of the few ways to boost research output on a planet. So if you dedicate a planet to research only, throwing down a scientist as a governor is definitely a good idea. Below the leaders we actually have, we have our recruitable leaders. Every five years, this pool of leaders will refresh. Leaders have specific ethics, as I mentioned before. They also have a home planet, which you can check out. In this case, for pretty much everybody, it's going to be Bob because we recruited them before we had more colonies. 
and a little bit of flavor here, you can see what job they previously held before they became a prestigious leader. Once we have discovered aliens, like for example here the Feralian Confederation, and then enough time has passed for the leader pool to refresh, we can then start recruiting external leaders as well. External leaders are basically aliens, and they'll probably come with differing ethics to that of your civilization. This can be one of the easiest ways to get leaders with differing ethics, put them on the council, and thus promote different ethics within your empire in order to change the governing ethics of your nation. Once you have fully unlocked every single tradition in a tradition tree, or five of them, you then get access to an Ascension perk. Ascensions are basically a very special and powerful bonus, sometimes that massively change the way you can play. These include some of the Ascension paths, for example, the genetic, cybernetic, synthetic, or psionic Ascension paths. They also include special things like becoming the Crisis, allowing you to attempt to destroy the entire universe, getting a Colossus project, aka a Death Star, but early on, they're generally mild bonuses. In this case, I'm going to take Mastery of Nature, which is not really that powerful, but allows us to increase the size of our planets by two. Why not? Basically, you can chop down all the wood, man, and then you'll just see what's going on. I've now taken the Diplomacy Tradition and the Form Federation perk in order to show off how federations work. We're going to form the United Federation of Planets here with our erstwhile neighbors who love us a lot. When we do that, a new icon appears on the top right. This is the Federation screen. If we open it, we get a number of tabs. First off, we can see what level the Federation is at. By assigning a leader to this Federation, we will boost its cohesion. For every level this leader is, it generates an additional one point of cohesion. If our cohesion is above zero, we will generate experience for the Federation. Every time we max out this experience bar, we'll go up a level. For every level, we will get additional bonuses for being members of the Federation, and the President will get a special bonus. Currently, we are the President, but that will change over time. We go to the member screen, we can see who is in the Federation. Given that our ethics match so perfectly, we actually have very few issues in this type of Federation. There is very little ethical diversity. The Fleets tab allows us to access the Federation ship designer, don't worry about that right now. And it lets us see where the Federation fleets are, what size they are, and what they are comprised of. The Law screen is probably the most important screen here. As our Federation levels up, we will be able to change the cohesion. Different levels of cohesion allow us to have more complicated and more integrated legal systems. At the start, you'll find that we have no unified fleet in this type of federation, a galactic union, which is one of the six federation types, the others being a trade league, that's more of a mercantile type federation, a research cooperative, you can guess what that is, a martial alliance, you can probably guess, a hegemony is an authoritarian type of federation where the president is the most powerful member and federation members cannot leave. Everyone does get some bonuses, but it's kind of like a master-slave relationship. Finally, Holy Covenant is a spiritual type federation that's focused on unity. We can change the succession type of our federation. At the moment, we have a rotation, so every member will become the president after a certain period of time. In this case, it's currently 20 years. As cohesion increases, the AI will be happier with changing the law, so we will probably soon be able to increase it to 40, thus ensuring we are the president for just a little bit longer. If we move to challenge, at the end of every term of office, a specific challenge type will be issued, some things will happen, some leaders may die, it can be a bit scary, if especially you have the arena challenge where you fight for Federation President, and then a new Federation President will be selected. At high levels of centralization, you can unlock the strongest succession type, meaning that whoever is strongest in the Federation becomes the President. That strength though can be measured as you see fit. There are a number of different options in the legal code. For example, it could be economic power, military power, research power, there are lots of ways of defining it. We can also choose whether or not subjects, which are vassals and tributes, are allowed to join the Federation, or whether or not they are kept at arm's length. We can choose whether voting is by equal weight, therefore each member gets one vote, or diplomatic weight. Diplomatic weight is listed here. This is the diplomatic weight of, a, of, of an empire. We can see our own diplomatic weight by going to the top here and checking out down here. You'll see we are slightly less diplomatically powerful, but they're very similar to the Ferelian Confederation. They're getting bonuses from being cooperative. 
if we switch over to cooperative, our diplo weight will increase proportionally as well. As our federation gets more cohesion, we can change the war declaration law so that only a majority vote will allow war declaration, or the president decides, the president chooses who declares war. Invitation of members starts at unanimous, then could become majority. Finally, the president decides who can kick members, a majority vote on removing someone from the federation, or the president deciding who removes enabling free migration and prohibiting separate treaties like commercial pacts, migration treaties, research treaties with empires outside the Federation. The further right you are on these, the more monthly cohesion it generally takes to maintain them. Cohesion, remember, is generated by sending officials into the Federation and getting these extra points. The higher the level they are, the more uh, cohesion they are producing. It is possible to completely use this legal system entirely to your advantage, as such be the president in perpetuity while everyone feels that they're getting a fair vote. It's, uh, it's a little bit silly. Also, only the president has command of the Federation fleet. And if the Federation were to be disbanded, if every member were to leave, then the Federation president gets to keep control of that Federation fleet. Federation fleets do not use up your own naval capacity, however, as a member of a federation, if you increase the fleet contribution, you will give up some percentage of your naval capacity to the federation in order to maintain a fleet here. Depending on your government form, you will have different ways of selecting new empire rulers. For democratic governments, you will get an election every 10 years. Here we currently have an election where all leaders that could go for president are in the running. Whichever leader has the most support at the end of the election term becomes the ruler. You can boost it by lobbying, by spending unity to increase the support of a certain leader. For example, I've supported one time here, getting a little bit of extra support for that leader. Support is based on the traits, skills, and whether or not the ruler is already this person, and the faction power of whichever faction that leader represents. In this case, Dolores Mwanga represents the egalitarian faction who have 68% of the support. After you've researched xenolinguistics, renowned leaders may start to appear. An example of that is Zazira Katun here. Renowned leaders generally are at level 4, they already have a class, a specialization, and a number of traits and an ethic. Generally these leaders are relatively powerful, if you have the space for them, you should probably employ them. We've now met a western neighbor that is somewhat militarily superior to us and also suspicious of us. This could mean we may have a war on our hands relatively soon. We should probably go and look at the fleet management tool in order to deal with that. So on fleet management, we can, you might be unsurprised to hear, manage our fleets. We can look at fleets we already own and create new fleets. These fleets are generally templates and allow us to build and add ships to fleets without having to manually go into each star base and queue them up. Here we can see the first fleet led by Ivan Tvadovsky, probably butchered that name, um, and we can see that their fleet stance is set to passive. It could be aggressive, meaning if it was aggressive, they would attempt to automatically attack any hostile fleets in the same system. We can also set their home base. I'm going to leave it on Sol, our capital for now, that's fine. We can choose for them to return home or to take point. I will turn them on to take point. That will encourage any allied AI fleets to follow up on our fleet, thus allowing us to multiply our firepower. If we add additional ships to this fleet, for example, let's say I want to add some destroyer class ships to this fleet. If we want to add some ships to this fleet, let's say, for example, some destroyer class ships, I click the add ship button and then I add a destroyer and I can use the plus and minus. Shift will add 10, control click adds the maximum possible and uh, in, in reverse it does the same thing, the minimum possible and losing 10. We can also see how many alloys these additional ships will cost or whatever resource it is it re we require to make them. We've got around 3,000 alloys, so we can afford to make 13 additional destroyers. But we also probably want to upgrade our corvettes here. So first we'll spend 388 upgrading our corvettes. And then with our remaining 2,600, we will buy 12 destroyers. Why do we need to upgrade our corvettes though? What on earth is going on there? Well, that is due to the ship designer. Now the ship designer allows us to look at each of the different ship classes we have in our Navy and design them. At the beginning of the game, you will have auto-generate designs turned on. For your first through run-throughs, I honestly wouldn't recommend you turn this off. You can micromanage and improve the ship designs drastically over what the AI does, 
But honestly, you're going to be very overwhelmed with everything that's happening. The planetary management, the, the diplomacy, the combat, uh, all of the little things. Trying to also manage your ship designs, I would not recommend that in the beginning. If you'd like to check out some guides on how to design your ships, I will leave a link in the description to a playlist where I basically got uh, ship designs for pretty much every class written up in there. If we really like how a fleet is composed and we simply want a second of those, we can click copy template. That will create a new fleet with the same templated ships assigned to it. Additionally, if we are in combat and we lose some ships, we can click the reinforce fleet button to automatically build new ships up to this template, 20 corvettes and 12 destroyers. We can also disband a fleet and if we have any mercenary capacity, we could turn a fleet of size 50 or more in command limit into a mercenary company. Also, if lots of ships have been destroyed and we simply want to throw the template out of the window, we can click overwrite fleet. That basically gets rid of whatever's written here and whatever is actually in the fleet at today's present moment will become the new fleet template. You may be wondering about command limit. Well, every ship has a naval capacity usage, partially represented by the number of symbols here. Corvettes have one, destroyers two, cruisers four, battleships eight, and titans 16. They also have a fleet command usage, equivalent to their naval capacity usage. So for each corvette, we use one command limit in the fleet and each destroyer uses two. We can only, due to our technology and traditions, have a maximum individual fleet size of 50. That limits how effective our admirals are at providing bonuses to a fleet. We cannot simply stack all of the ships up into one single mega fleet. I briefly mentioned leader classes before. What are they? Well, when your leader reaches level four, you can decide which class they are. All leader types, be they scientist, commander, or official, have four possible classes. The furthest right class is always a class that is useful for the council. Depending on which class you select, that also changes which possible new traits the leaders will have. Scientists can have the statistician that boosts research speed if they're on the council. Analyst increases their ability to provide physics research as a planetary governor. Scholar makes them better at surveying anomalies, researching archaeology sites or astral rifts. And explorer, generally the worst of all of the categories, increases your survey speed and anomaly discovery chance. That's usually quite bad because generally we explore most of the galaxy pretty quickly and then this leader becomes pretty useless later on in the game if they are focused on exploration. Admirals have similar classes. Some are good at planetary governing, others are good at commanding armies or commanding fleets. Officials have advisors which are good at being on the council or also being on the council with more of a diplomatic focus. Then there are delegates which are very very good at being in the galactic community or in a federation or, or finally a veteran trait that makes them very good at being governors. Choose wisely when you want to select your veteran trait and make sure you don't overload yourself. For example here I'm going to choose to become a statistician even though I already have a statistician, this leader is actually immortal. So when this one may die, because leaders have an age and if you hover over it, you can also see that they have a life expectancy. Anything above their life expectancy, at this in this case it's 80, and they start having a monthly chance of dying. That chance goes up the older they are. In the end, your leaders will always die of old age. That's just how stats work. Let's take a look at war in a little bit of additional detail now. So we can click on the claims tab and start claiming other systems as long as we are not pacifist or if we are pacifist, if we're in a defensive war. Claiming systems basically means that we are saying we have the right of ownership of these systems. We have to spend influence and the further away a claim is from us, the more it costs us to claim it. On top of that, if there are any colonies, any star bases in a system, that increases the cost yet further. You can see the breakdown right here on your screen. After we've made some claims, if we then go to the declare war screen, you'll see that we have a new war goal available, the conquer claim war goal. We also have animosity available because this belligerent empire and I have both declared ourselves rivals. So what we're going to do now is declare war. We need to select our war goal. In this case, I'm going to use humiliate and then we're going to click declare war. Now, this is going to have a vote in our Galactic Federation and they voted no. Uh, we can't do it right now then. Because we're in a federation and currently we have the war declaration set to unanimous or majority vote, we can't declare war without our neighbors also choosing to declare war. So I've gone and poked the Ray of Citizen League and I think they're about to declare war on us. We've had a war declaration come in now. At this point, we get the war screen in the bottom. This shows us the effects of the war. 
each side has a war exhaustion between 0% and 100%. Once you hit 100% war exhaustion after two years, the enemy can force you to settle a status quo peace. At that point, any occupied claims, which are, as I say, occupied, will change hands. And it could be, depending on the goals, you might also, if you have a tributary war goal, create a new civilization out of that tribute. If you have the liberation war goal, one of the coolest war goals where you're attempting to flip the ethics of the enemy civilization over to be aligned with your ethical alignment, you could create a new civilization out of just those ethics, a new nation out of just uh, those occupied planets in that area. What I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to change war goal to liberation war, and then we can choose, as I said before, the impose ideology. Now, I already have some claims, so let's go for the impose ideology war goal. If you want to take planets straight up, conquer or humiliate would be good, but I want to make this empire into friends. They're too militaristic. They are fanatic militarists, in fact, and we should make them fanatic egalitarians. Now, the war has begun. We can see their systems are highlighted here in red because they are our enemies. Ours and our allies are green and blue. We're going to wait for the other fleets to form up and join us. As I do, don't forget, have take point set on the first fleet. Now that we've got them joining up with us, we're going to go and press forwards into the enemy space and launch the attack. I should also get some armies, so I will go to the army builder tab on a starbase and queue up some armies. Using control, I can queue up lots at the same time. We've detected a large fleet here of 5,000 ships. Zooming in, if I had more intel, I am building a spy network, but my infiltration level is at 50. If I had more intel, intel is equal generally to infiltration level. This can cap out at 100, but in order to boost it, you need more code breaking relative to their encryption to get this infiltration level higher. We could also go about acquiring some assets, running some of these special operations. I won't go into detail into what all of these do. They basically do what they say on the tin. In order to run an operation, you click on it, you probably click commence when, when ready so you don't have to keep coming back to it, and then you click launch. It's going to cost you some influence with monthly energy upkeep. It will have a difficulty. Again, this, this will be a screen you're kind of familiar with. It looks like archaeology sites or first contact. If we add an asset in here, which is currently what we were going to be grabbing, then we might be able to boost our skill, reducing the time it takes. We don't have that, so we're just going to do it as is. If we had higher intelligence, if we were at 60, we would be able to see things like the enemy's ship designs, meaning we could counter them if we were building our own ships. We could also see uh, things to do with technologies, economics. Uh, at the moment, we have medium government intel, which is quite a bit. Uh, we can see things about their capital, like where it is, where all of their individual planets are. And now we're going to go and simply engage the enemy. Generally, as long as your fleet power numbers are higher than the enemy's fleet power numbers, you're going to win. If it's a factor of 30, 40, 50%, you probably don't need to worry about ship designs. You are going to win. We're now all together in the same system. We're going to simply right click on the enemy fleet to send our fleet over to attack them. We've now engaged. This is the combat screen. This basically is going to give us lots of information about what is going on in the combat. First off, we can see the enemy ships, how many uh, hull points, armor points, shields they have, what kind of bonuses they're getting. We can also see our own ships. We can see the admirals that are on their fleets. They've got a level three and a level four admiral. We have a level two, a level four, and our ally here has a level five admiral. If we select just the enemy fleets in this combat, we actually are going to get both our fleet and our allies' fleets on the left-hand side, which is very, very good. The balance of power meter at the top here basically just shows you how many hull points you have relative to the enemy hull points. Don't necessarily give this symbol too much credence. At the bottom, we get what is really important, the damage output. On the right-hand side, we can see their damage output and the efficiency of their weapon systems. On the left-hand side, we can see our damage output and the efficiency of our weapon systems. We also have the same for armor and shields. Also, we have the hit ratio. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but the higher this is, the better. We can see how many of our shots have missed and how many were evaded by the enemy. Uh, this is a percentage modifier. 70% of all of our shots are actually dealing damage is, is what this is telling us. And with a further breakdown on which weapons have different types of accuracies and which are being evaded more. If we are losing, we can attempt to initiate an emergency FTL jump to get out of the combat. We're not losing though, we are clearly winning and we're stamping all over the enemy's neck. 
Now that combat has been completed, we get some combat statistics. We can see how many enemy ships were destroyed and how many of our own ships were destroyed. Here we can see we've lost three corvettes from the uh, Federation fleet and two of our own corvettes. To deal with that, I can simply and immediately just click reinforce fleet. It's not too difficult. We also, as you can see, have taken some damage here. Now, damage can be repaired over time for both hull and armor by returning to an upgraded star base, either your own or an allied. Shield hit points regenerate naturally over time. You don't need to worry about those. What I think we're going to do is beeline for this system over here, take the star base, and then once we own the star base, we'll then be able to repair in enemy space. After a fleet engagement, you might also notice a special project marker. You can see that as well here in the situation log, it is debris. When you defeat enemy ships, when you win a combat, you have a chance of them dropping some debris. The debris contains traces of the components they used in their ships, meaning if you bring a science ship over here, which we are immediately going to do to do this research project, I'm going to select one, right click research project. When we complete that, if we do it before the timeout, we could unlock access to researching these technologies. That is very good if you're at a technological disadvantage to your enemy. Now that we are fully repaired, I can see that because the heart next to it says 100%, we're going to push further into the enemy territory. I'll also bring up my armies now so we can have a look at ground combat. Because we've been fighting in a war, there have been some changes to our ethics attraction. So we are in an active war and we have pops that are citizens and an empire is bordering an enemy empire. This means the militarist faction, the Glory Initiative, have formed and they really are very unhappy. We're not conquering anyone. We also have benevolent subjugation. We have a cooperative diplomatic stance. They think that's weakness. We're not using all of our naval capacity. We're not in a martial alliance. They're really not super happy with us. When it comes to invading planets now, we've got our fleet here of 571 army power. We first need to enter orbit. Now, there's two things we can do. We can look at the planet here in the army tab and see what size the garrison is. If the garrison is smaller than the number of armies you've got, you'll, you'll probably win. On top of that, if we want to soften up a planet before we can invade, we can bombard it from orbit. When we start bombarding, we can decide whether to prohibit or allow their surrender. I recommend you allow it. That basically means once you've bombarded the planet into the dirt and blown away all the garrison, the remaining population will probably surrender to you. Bombarding does a couple of things. First off, as I mentioned, it deals damage to the ground forces on the planet. But second, what it also does is it deals devastation to the planet. Here we know that we are at 0.033% devastation. And it keeps going up a little bit every single day. And we can increase that further by changing our bombardment policy from selective to indiscriminate. That's making it go up even faster. Now, more bombardment means that we are reducing the resource output of the planet. We also reduce its upkeep, but we're basically destroying its economy. On top of that, once we hit 25% devastation, we may start to kill the population there in our bombardment campaign. If we change back to selective bombardment, we will not kill the last 21 pops there, and we will not bombard undefended planets. Indiscriminate, however, means we'll just keep bombarding them into the ground, but we'll do lots and lots of damage to the armies. So it, it's faster. Once our armies are in orbit, we can either select them, right click and click land armies, or we can go to the army tab on the planet and click land armies as well. I'm going to employ somebody here as a commander, giving us a little bit of extra army damage. And if you're not sure whether or not you can invade the planet, it's always best to set your fleet stance to aggressive. This means the AI will not only follow your uh, military fleets, your, your main fleets with your armies, but it will invade any planets that it thinks it can win on. When you invade, your circles will fight their circles and glorious battle ensues and, and this is it, yeah. So you have a specific combat width. Now combat width here, what that does, it represents how many circles can attack the other circles. Armies have health and morale unless they are, of course, uh, machine armies or zombie armies. Yes, those are things in Stellaris, zombies exist. Then there is no morale. We can't do any morale damage, but it also means they can't be broken. So, you know, when you deal enough morale damage to an army, they will be broken and they will stop attacking you and probably retreat. Armies may also disengage before they're dead. This is good as the attacker because it means you won't lose armies in the fight. And after the fight is done, your armies will repair themselves back up, hopefully to full health. You can see we're getting closer and closer and closer here 
to winning the war. Their war exhaustion is at 79, part of that is attrition, so every month war exhaustion does slowly tick up, but also for every ship lost on either side, war exhaustion goes up, and during ground battles, if either side loses armies, specifically those are assault armies, defensive armies don't count, war exhaustion goes up as well. We've started to gain some rare resources by mining them. Now, what that allows us to do is unlock some special edicts for war. If you scroll down in your edicts, you'll see these special rare resource edicts. For example, exotic gases as fuel increases our sublight speed, our ships go faster. We can increase our shield hit points. We can make our kinetic weapons deal more damage, our missiles deal more damage. We can make our armor better. All of these things are good to do. They will buff your fleets in combat. Here is 3.5K. Let's say I turn on reactive armor, explosives, the shield boost, we've just gone up to 3.8k. That is a nice bonus. Getting 10% extra uh, fleet power simply from turning on an edict, spending a few rare resources for a few days to months is really good. When you're no longer in combat, do remember to turn them off again because there's no need to waste our money. Now we have pushed the enemy here to 100% war exhaustion we could probably force them out to status quo. Now, you can see here the acceptance rates. We can surrender, of course, they'll accept that. We could also push for status quo. This would create a new empire as an ally or subject of us out of the three Rayob systems. It would be an ally of ours because we are doing the liberate war goal. We can't quite push war goals yet because we haven't occupied all of our claims. We need to occupy those claims to be able to force that war goal through. In order to press this war, basically you can see we need to occupy the unclaimed systems that we have claimed. That is Kodria, Till, and Eswiri. Once we've done that, we'll lose that minus 30, and we, we should be pretty good. Also, additionally, getting more occupation will also increase the acceptance on the other side. Once this is above zero, so once it's one, we'll be completely fine. I mentioned leader death before. You can see here our leader has died. When a leader dies, you can basically do pretty much nothing or you'll get a special ability based on some of your ethics to do something else. Are we going to have a small commemoration service? That will give us more unity and stability empire-wide because our leader is dead. And as you can see, we've suddenly reached a point where the enemy has surrendered. We have achieved victory. What has that done? Well, the Rayob are entirely different now. They are the Rayob Alliance and they are no longer hostile. They're very very friendly. We, in fact, can invite them straight away into our great and glorious Federation. Doing that has given us some more contacts out there in the universe, and we've reached a turning point. Once one empire has met over half of the galaxy, then you can begin to form the galactic community. If you say no, you won't join it, but if, if enough empires say yes, it will be created. When you conquer any planets, we did take one planet in this war, you will get the recently conquered modifier on any pops there. Recently conquered, as you can see, takes 20% off their happiness and reduces governing ethics attraction by 25%, meaning it's highly likely they will join factions inimical to your government. The discoveries tab here is where we look at minor artifacts. We have a bunch of decisions. Minor artifacts are generated by uh, archaeology dig sites, and then when you complete them, there is a chance a minor artifact deposit will form, which you can put a science station around and get a monthly income for. These decisions do things like give you unity, for example, if we celebrate diversity, or we can sell some for some energy. Through research, we can also unlock more decisions. The other tab here is Astral Actions. That really only becomes available in the mid game when we have unlocked Astral Sphere technology and we can dive into Astral Rifts. If we were to take any vassals, we'd get access to the Agreements tab here in Communications. And the Agreements tab allows you to look over all of your vassals, see what the contract is doing, and make changes to their vassal contract. You can spend influence basically to make them pay you a tithe or give them subsidies along with changing what their rights are, whether they get to vote, whether they have to vote in the same way you vote, etc, etc. The only two tabs I've not really talked about here are the Expansion Planner. This basically gives you access to knowing, well, which worlds do I know about, which of those are colonizable, for example, and this allows you to plan further expansion into the galaxy. For example, Thrish 104A here, I don't know why it's 104A, but fair enough. Oh, it's Thrish C4A because there's three stars. That does make more sense. Thrish C4A, five, uh, five uh, 4A, okay. Anyway, this planet can be colonized. We've got people with the required habitability. Uh, generally, on the habitability note, I'd recommend you don't really go for anything below 20%. If you do, only use it for pop growth 
and, uh, and make sure any other pops either are resettled or automatically migrate. Talking about automatic migration and resettlement, looking over here at the right hand side, we've got some things being displayed about our planet. For example, planet Bob here has a symbol which looks like a briefcase in yellow. That means there are unemployed pops who may automatically resettle, so these pops will, of their own accord, randomly move to another planet without us having to do anything. We can, of course, also attempt to resettle them. We, are, well, we can't resettle biological pops because we don't have the right to do that. We don't have the resettlement policy active, and we don't want to do that with fanatic egalitarians. We're the good guys. We don't forcibly resettle populations. But we could resettle some robots if we wanted to. Further down, you can see that Schlemming is having a stability issue. It has stability under 25, so I would normally distribute luxury goods. I can't do that. I guess what I'll do instead is build a luxury residence for more amenities that way. We need that approval stability, I should say, to be above 25%. Otherwise, we could end up within one to three years having a rebellion. If this briefcase was in red, that would mean there is an unemployed pop that cannot go anywhere. There's no open job for it. The only way pops are able to migrate is if there is a planet they can live on. And for example, like at Pangaea here, we have available jobs. There's six jobs available in Pangaea that pops, human pops could move over to. Now that the galactic community has formed, let's take a quick look. First off, we can of course hire somebody and send them in as a delegate. I'm going to hire one of these Bajorts in that we just conquered technically and send them straight into the community. That is going to boost our diplomatic weight. Diplomatic weight is a mixture of fleet power, that is the power of your ships, pops, that is the number of pops you have multiplied by their happiness. Happier pops are worth more diplomatically. Your economic weight, which is simply a weight of all of your production for all of the resources and technology. That is a measure of all of the technologies you have researched. If we go over to resolutions, you'll see there's a whole host of different laws we can propose here in the community. Reforming and getting the Galactic Council is a cornerstone necessary to getting a custodian, which is then necessary if you want to reform the Senate into the first Galactic Empire. I would definitely recommend doing that for the fun of it. Otherwise though, there are lots of different things we can propose. I'm going to propose regulatory facilitation, that reduces habitability, it increases diplomatic weight from economy, and makes every worker in the galaxy produce more resources. As we go down one of these legislative trees, you'll see that basically it stacks more and more effects until at level 5 it's got some very large effects that are sometimes really good in some ways, but also quite bad in others. For example here, environmental ordnance waivers reduces habitability by 25%, but grants us 20% more minerals from jobs, 5% alloys, uh, more worker pop resource output, and 100% additional diplomatic weight from economy. That's not just us, that is everybody in the community including the unscrupulous Commonwealth of Man. Briefly coming back to the economy, if you run out of a resource, if you are in deficit and then end up at zero, you end up with a deficit situation. Here we can see it in the Situations tab right at the top, and if we open our Situation Log it's also in there. Basically deficits advance depending on how much you're losing each month, until you get to the finisher. At the finisher, your empire will default. Defaulting is awful. Look at all of these terrible things that happen to you. Um, and uh, you will get some free resources and your economy should basically restabilize. But honestly, it's better to buy whatever you need. For example, I am now going to buy some monthly food to make sure we are producing plenty of food. If we are producing food and we have a positive balance, this is going to go back by minus five and quickly disappear. Once it hits zero, the situation goes away and these negative effects will no longer be impacting our empire. If you get multiple deficits at once, you could end up in a perfect storm where you are getting so many negative modifiers that you simply cannot manage your economy at all anymore. That is what we call an economic death spiral. Do try and avoid it. We've covered all of the resources. We've covered the galactic community and federations. We've covered war. We've covered diplomacy. We've covered everything in this menu. And we've covered everything you can see on your screen. At this point, I believe there is nothing else you need to know to be able to play this game to its fullest. Yes, you will not be playing in the most efficient manner. You're going to be exploring. You're going to be discovering. You are going to face the final frontier. I have a host of other videos basically covering lots of different guides for uh, builds, for, for ethics, origins, civics, traits, all of that sort of stuff on this channel. If you'd like to check that out, I'll also link the uh, tier list playlist in the description below where I've got loads of tier lists. Tier lists are a great way of understanding 
how things work in Stellaris because I basically go through, I, I pick a topic, for example, I'll pick civics and I will go through every civic available, rank its uh, power, rank its effectiveness, how helpful it is for your empire, and then talk about what it also does so you can understand what all of the civics at your disposal are. Of course, this guy did utilize all of the DLC. If you want to be able to play at this level and you've only just picked up the game, Paradox currently offer a subscription you could buy for just one month and try out the full game and get access to all of the DLC. You can also wait for sales. I'd recommend waiting for sales and buy individual DLC. If you'd like to know which DLC you should probably get next, I do have a tier list of DLC where I also recommend some DLC combinations in there as well at the end. So I'll put a link to that as well in the description below. And I also need to mention there are things I have not covered here. I've not covered Ascension Paths in detail. I've also not covered late game things like mega structures, uh, titans, battleships, that sort of stuff. But honestly, this is a good basis, a good beginner's guide and foundation. From here, we're at year 50, you can basically go wherever you would like. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to see another video recommended by this channel, I'll let the mysterious YouTube gods decide which one apparently you might like best. Apparently it's this one down here on the left. If you'd like to see that video, click the screen now.